This is a famous effigy you see of a Scythian warrior holding a spear. Back of his spear is gone. You can see a lot of things in this picture. A lot of people don't see certain things. First of all, it's the people that are harnessing the power of a horse and have domesticated it and indeed actually genetically got it to the point that it is at this point. And their lineage actually took it further on than that and made many of the breeds that we see today. You can see he's wearing pants and a top that's on there. Has a beard and long hair. Kind of has a Jesus look. You One could say, man, oh, Jesus on a white horse. His top is polka dotted. His pants seem to have little crosses all over them. Let's get into this and more about it. And more about horses, too, a little bit here. I want to show you something. A warrior's face frozen in time. Gold, hemp, tents, and cheese tell the Scythian tale. The Scythians were a mysterious and fascinating people. They were nomads, had left no known writing, yet their elaborate burials and tattoos have given up some of their story. A new exhibition at the British Museum wants to present as much of that information as possible, right down to the detail of a scar running along the cheek of a ferocious-looking Scythian warrior. The Guardian reports the real face of the mummified head of the Scythian warrior was concealed by a clay mask, which we're familiar with with other things I've shown, for almost 2,000 years. His facial features are closely reflected on the painted mask that covers it, though. Liz Leah Floor of Ancient Origins provided a brief description of Scythians. The Scythians were a nomadic people of Iranian descent, ancient Iran, who migrated from Central Asia into Southern Russia and Eastern Europe. They founded a powerful empire in the region of what is now Crimea and were well known for their skills in battle and their horsemanship. No Scythian cities or settlements remain now, but their burial kurgans can be found from Mongolia to the Black Sea. Here's an ancient depiction of Scythians fighting ancient Slavs. You notice this black horse rider here is carrying something that's mace. It's very reminiscent of quite a few people who had a mace for a battle type thing. The other ones here are coming in on that. You can see that there's a man down the bottom left of the black horse. And the other warrior's coming in apparently to avenge him. And he's got the advantage here at the point where the two horses come in together. And got a spear going for apparently his top of his chest or his throat. Doesn't look good. And that's just ancient time stuff. But in battles between ancient Caucasian people that went on for a long time. With the combination of mummified Scythian warrior heads. And a scan of the same mummified Scythian warrior heads. Researchers discovered much about the man's facial features. For example, they know now that his teeth were in real good condition, and he had a light-colored, blondish red mustache and hair and pierced ear, and a scar that ran from the corner of his left eye socket down to his jaw that had been stitched back together, by the way. They also found the hole where his brains had been removed from his skull. What? Yeah, they used to mummify a lot of their remains, too, but they took a lot of the meat out of it and the brain, too, so they weren't able to desiccate it necessarily like an Egyptian mummy. We'll get into that further a little bit. Here's a CAT scan, and so you can see that blondish red hair that's on him here, what's left of it, and shows up on the scan, I guess you'd say. But, yeah, decent teeth, if you will, prominent chin and so on. But you can see that scar that's running from his eye socket down and how it had been stitched back together. Now, they take the brain out of holes that they created in the head rather than trying to go through the nose inconspicuously and pop through that septum area back through the brain there and rottle it around and get it back out. They did it in an easier form. It was much the same, though. The preservation of the warrior's head isn't surprising because the Scythians were skilled at mummification. 
As an article created by the British Museum leading up to the exhibition explained, the Scythians took great effort to preserve the appearance of the dead using a form of mummification. They removed the brain matter through holes cut in the head, sliced the bodies, and removed as much soft tissue as possible before replacing both with dry grass and sewn up in the skin. From there, the permafrost took over the preservation of organic materials. Also, if you'll read some of the articles on this, we'll go into the fact that uh, there were ancient tales that the, whenever they died, the people would eat them or something like that, and that's actually not, it's probably a misunderstanding of the whole burial rite situation because they were taking the meat out of that situation. Now, what's done with that, people can get wildly uh, imaginative about, but the, in real uh, realism, what they were doing here was mummifying the dead. And uh, it was a different practice, too, from before this point. You go back into the last ice age, and people were building up deuses and putting the dead on it and letting birds peck away it and take them up into the sky, which started the whole thing leading through to angels that we have today. But that's for a totally different video. Margaret Moose described the nature of elite Scythian burials for ancient Orient. The Scythians buried their high-status dead in mounds called kurgans or tumuli. We know them as Isaac burial types too, but the dead were laid out often as if asleep in a hollowed-out log, something like a canoe, and facing the east. Now this is important because that right there goes along with a whole lot of different people that kept that same symbology from a time before. We've talked about it in other videos, but it goes along with red ochre burials and all types of things and facing the new sun, just like in the Egyptians' Book of the Dead, which is coming forth by day and so on. Grave goods included fine clothes, jewelry, food, cannabis, hand mirrors. Keeps going on, tells you that there's also horse tack, bows, swords, shields, and entire chariots and horses and often other humans so like in many cultures the great people that there were would take a, along with them to the afterlife because everybody knew with everything that went on they were going to get to go and they were sometimes privileged to be able to go along with him to the afterlife involving a boat through the sky and all of these other concepts of the milky way but Horse burials go along with these people too, of course, and we can find that in the spread of horses and the way things went with the same type of people. We've talked about it quite a few other times here. So um, just in a slight thing, you talked about they already had hand mirrors and all types of things back then, and incredible gold artifacts have been shown by them and uh, uh, intricate soldery being able to be done, all kinds of things. There's a cup that's made of electrum, which is a mix of gold and uh, copper. Scythian warriors draw after figures on an electrum cup from the Kulubaba Kurgan burial near Kerch. Remember Kerch, we'll be back to it. The warrior on the right is stringing his bow, bracing it behind his knee. Hair seems to be normally have to have been worn long and loose, and beards were apparently worn by all adult men. The other two warriors on the left are conversing, both holding spears and javelins. The man on the left is wearing a diadem and therefore is likely meant to represent the Scythian king. And so you can see the guy on the left has had that band, and it looks somewhat like Aragon out of Lord of the Rings, but you notice that he is wearing boots and pants, but has a cloak, an extra point that goes on to it of his wear, and real good scratched artwork that's done into this, especially for the time we're talking about. He looks very Jesus-like, if you will, but then the man next to him, talking in the middle, has that Phrygian cap we're all familiar with, and so does the guy on the right. And they talk about this guy on the right where he's putting this bow, and he's having to put his leg across the other one and use force 
You can't do it just a normal way and hold it out at arm's length and pop it somehow. It's not going to work. In fact, these bows, you don't leave ready to go. You actually have them unhooked. It screws up everything. Anyhow, that is a small bow or a horseman's bow there. You have to use a smaller one so you can cross back and forth and so on. It has a limited range compared to the next one, but still it's a double bent back type of recurve bow and has a lot of power to it. A lot more than a lot of people's bows at the time before they run into them had. And we'll show that here in a minute. We'll go off and look at some pictures of some things. But Kirch is where they found this at and linguistically that hooks up with church. Yeah, I know it seems far off, but it really isn't that far off. It hooks up with Proto-Indo-European linguistics, which comes through in places like German, and you get things in words like Kirk. Yeah, so that carries through to Old English and the word that we now know today, which is a strange connection, but let me make another connection you're more familiar with, perhaps. Kirk we just talked about. Well, there's Kirk Douglas, and you see this man doing this bow here. Some of you might remember the movie Ulysses from the late 1950s that Kirk Douglas had done. He's passed away now, but lived to be, what, 102 years old? What was it, 102? Anyhow, when he played the brave Ulysses in that movie, and it was Penelope's honor and all these men where she had put men off forever and they were hanging out here and to get rid of them she made this impossible test where she took this recurve type of bow that was Ulysses and said if somebody can make this bow and even put it on there but shoot through I forget what it was 10 or 12 axe handles where the hole where the handle goes into it lined up like a bullseye but through times 10 that they could have her hand and all these men try to curve that bow and they can't get it done. They can't get it done. And then Kirk Douglas just grabs a hold of it and goes, Wop. Well, first he comes on like a beggar, if you've ever seen the movie. And people don't know who the hell he is and they laugh at him and so on. And then all of a sudden he bows it up and then whips off his stuff. And they go, oh my God, it is Ulysses. And he shoots it through the ding and everybody, ah. And then he takes out the one guy that's all being cocky and proceeds to hide around pillars and do things and pretty much take out everybody if they can't get the hell out of there. Oh, before he takes and locks the door down and it falls down so they can't get out of there. Anyhow, so he has to do it a certain way to even get that bow to do. And when I was a kid, we had a, uh, bows. I had one smaller. My older brother had a bigger one. He had a long bow. I had a bow that was would work as a regular bow like an Indian bow one way, and it gave 55 pounds of pressure, I remember. But if you turned it around the other way, it said it was 70, and it gave that recurve effect, which looks like the shape of the one that you're seeing here. And it was smaller, so it was a horseman's type of bow. But my brother's gave 90, but it was built like a longbow, so it couldn't do any more than that. Anyhow, we uh, figured out we could take this thing and shoot about 200 yards with it and break that pretty easy if we ended up laying on our backs and putting it on our feet with one on either side of where the arrow goes then take the longest arrows we had if you took the shorter ones it would just pull back and flop and put it on there and you had to crean back and at a certain angle then stretch out and let it go and uh, used to do it in this place I used to hit golf balls and that and stuff now yeah we would hit it over 200 yards easy 210 220 so it's something that you could have used in distant combat way back when. Kind of a technique situation. We'll get in horses here now and go a little different way with it. But remember that recurve bow. and Oh, you might know of it as coming in with the supposed Hyksos that went into Egypt. Well, now they find out the people that were running the Hyksos thing were people that were endemic there for a long time. But there's still that misnomer of all of a sudden chariots, horses, recurve bows, and everything came in. And what does that have to do with reality? We've talked about that in other videos. Get into it a little bit here and show you some. Horses were very important to the Scythians. The animals provided them with milk, meat, skin, and transport for regular travel for archers rushing into battle. 
They were also essential companions for elites into the afterlife. An artifact included in the current exhibition, which demonstrates the importance of horses to the Scythians, is a felt and leather horse mask topped with a ram's head and a cockerel between its horns. Gold leaf fish are located along the horse's mask peak. And a cockerel is just a rooster, actually. And so what this has got is a ram and a rooster. Some other depictions show it kind of like a phoenix. We've talked about war horses and things that are a little different with that breed of horses rather than a work horse. And what you would use quarter horses for and so on. I have recently did a video about cowboys and you'd say, well, these people that had horses and uh, wore boots and pants and uh, funny looking hats that uh, were in wagons that could be pulled by them and going west. When was that? Oh, well, that's the American, you know, that's the you know, way of the West and going through and cowboys and everything. Yeah, well, that whole cowboy idea and these people go back way farther. People that domesticated horses and cows and ended up going West. So that goes on a lot further than before. In fact, let's just go ahead and take a look at Scythian horse masks. So... It's going to catch between. Let's see if I can go back to it. Here we go. And so this is the one we're talking about. Ooh, that went quick. Looking at. And so it's got a rooster or a type of phoenix bird on top of a ram, which signifies Aries, like the Aryans we talk about, Proto-Indo-Europeans. And here it is on a horse's helmet mask. But if you look, he stood up on a point and stabbed onto that point. What is that point? Well, if we took that off of the situation, you'd have a point going up. There's unicorns. And there are some of these war horses that had that. I need to do a totally separate video on war horses. You can see that this mask fit over the horse's head and let his ears come out naturally. They've done a lot of depictions and redone of them, and a lot of them would look like a parade pony or something you would see on a carousel. And there's a reason that that look kept carrying on, but if you've seen Egyptian art where they show the horses and trampling people and all the things on the art on the walls, very much in this exact same guise. So we can see where this heralded from and came through down through in the Middle East in this time. And this one horned, or sometimes it's two horned. If you look, here's a real one rather than a depiction of it. Again, it has ram's horns, different curling out, gold balls on the end, all types of gold foil work over it and everything. But then also on top of it, it has this winged creature. It's more like a phoenix. And in this version, its ears are covered up, although they'd still be in there, but there are a lot of little holes cut in it so he could still hear real good. And you can tell on this one that that flap that you see in the other one actually comes forward. And there's an extra piece that's a whole nose piece that goes with it too. That has decoration and so on going with it. But one I wanted to show you also is one they've shown here. For what they've done is they've turned a horse, yeah, you know, that giant horse, into something that looks like an elk. Or the ancient king of the forest, if you will. Like you see in Lord of the Rings, where the elves are riding this thing that you equate, if you've looked into it, into Saronis, and this giant European-type elk that used to live through the Younger Dryas time and died off in it, and had this huge rack that was on it. And there's different depictions of this. I might see a few more of them, like something like this, even fully decorated out, fully saddled out. Parade ponies. Something you'd see in a carousel. But it has a much different look. That's another depiction of the same thing as before, just Scythian warrior, but a different one. Look at this intricate horse cowling. Now this is a modern day depiction of something that goes with a war horse. And you can see this wing over the eyebrow and the way they're able to look. These are people that started using blinders and things for horses for certain reasons too. Yep, here's one of those ones that's old in time and using wood and branches and so on, recreated this Saronis type of helmet. 
Here's somebody who redid Ancient Scythians, and you can see how that is. It's a real horse. That's that's it. Two horns coming out of its head. Things that people would say, that's got to be some kind of griffin creature or something. No. no, but all kinds of tales were told of him, even centaurs, where this man's coming up out of a horse-like deer body. What the hell's going on with that? Well, he was a horseman. And if you take that to the most blandness of it, horse man. What's that? That's a centaur. Some of these things are pretty bland and straightforward. There's another depiction of that same one, but here we can see one decorated up and having that elk type form on it again and a cowling all around the head, which is a protective type thing for the horse. There's a depiction of the two-horned version that they have a lot of. These ancient Scythians what they kind of look like depictions well how cool were their saddles oh they were real cool here's a version of their saddle and the blanket thing that goes along with it that hangs over which would have been cinched under the bottom in a full saddle situation and a loop set into it in the top but it's got a ram it's got a griffin attacking a ram very common iconography and we we talk about tattoos and that's got to do with these people and all types of things. There we can see it again, a few different versions of this. And you show all the time this deer that has these super racks on them. So, horns. Much like the bull horns that you'll see through the time of Taurus and so on. And they've made all kinds of intricate things. We talked about boots recently to go along with the cowboy thing. And uh, one pair of boots that they found. Look at this intricate boot set that was here. Notice it's double sole and inset that's on it. But look at what's done on the inset of the boot. Now there are individual gems it looks like inset here with little gold bars in between each one. A piping done around it and everything. But also there's this filigree pattern here that's done with little bitty micro gold beads with little bitty holes done through them stitched all up on it. Surely if you rode around on that and just for a little while you'd ruin it. But these are ceremonial type boots that are buried with them. Hey, that video game that I play and the Halloween thing you can get a horse head and you can even get a unicorn type head. But all the unicorn has to be is just a headpiece like this and coming right out of the center of it a spike of an ancient war horse. We've talked about what unicorns really is and how that mimics the idea of rhinoceros unicornis. Here we find an ancient comb. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, but you can't really see all the detail. One horse is down, one up. Scythian warriors fighting each other. Phrygian caps, the whole nine yards. A row of lions that they're on, and ancient combs. I had a guy get on and try to tell me where combs came from recently. That's hilarious. There's ancient people having combs back up, but had a mammoth bone and things. You can see this guy, it almost looks like he's breaking a horse. In fact, this is a depiction in that Phrygian type helmet that you see and you see all in the ancient Persians and so on. And little gold balls all over this thing in sequins of done of gold. There he is with that smaller bow. Eh, you can't hardly make it out, but that smaller horseman's bow. Yeah, that fake horse head, that's great somebody of the time recently but you can see this and also their helmets if you look at it in their artwork look very much Trojanish Romanish what yeah that leads to another thing too even the shield with the little half moon with the crescent they can see over and shoot over what are they what do they look like and you can see the armor that that all goes through and so they started making all kinds and you less armor or more of somebody who is doing something dexterous and more armor for others. Look at this helmet. Looks like something you might have seen out of Conan, right? Got a sun symbol across it, right in that exact point. Nose bridges and so on like that. Yeah, but some of their helmets look very Mandalorian-ish for a reason. So anyhow, Hey, horses.
and what they have to do with it. And I guess, you know, we talk about war horses, their type of bows, situations. Hey, there's a better look at that artwork. And even though on that comb, this is real small and I'm in blurry on it, if I quit moving around, you can see there's sequined armor here and it's overlapped like fish scales onto it that although they have a skirt looking apparatus built into it, they have legging with designs on it and everything, very intricately carved. Legging, boots, a leg guard that's on here, and again that Trojan-esque helmet that you see there, and a Phrygian cap. Other depictions of types of helmets like that, ear and Taurus in the time of a bull, and there's that sequin overlaid plate mail, dragon scale, if you will. So let's go back. If it will let me. And So horses were very important to the Scythians. The animals provided them with milk and everything they talk about here. But imagine that, I don't know if you've ever rode a horse, but a horse is, man, it, it, whenever you're a kid or young, being able to ride on one and something like that. Here you can see that one that they showed in that picture. A little more up close here. Even some gold inlay still on it ram's head. You can tell it's been painted. Stitched leather around and everything. So fancy. Rooster, if you will. Phoenix to some. Other depictions. Oh, I didn't show it, but right there in that group, there was another one that you go, that's very Phoenix-esque. But anyhow, horses, though, were like a car. In Zoom, they run much faster than a person, and if you're on it not having to run and the horse is doing it, you can go much long distances and things, and it's amazing. And to people that don't have this, it was an overwhelming fact. And although they have donkeys and things like that, there's no comparison whatsoever. It's like a bike and a motorcycle. So it's a big jump. I'll do another one about war horses and ancient stories about what war horses had done and so on, but let's continue. This warrior's mummified head and its scan plus the horse's mask are part of the exhibition Scythians, Warriors of Ancient Siberia at the British Museum. These artifacts are on loan from the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. Some other artifacts appearing in the exhibit, exhibit include sticks and a brazier, they were used in tents where Scythians smoked hemp, a man's headgear, furniture, tattooed skin, a decorated leather bag that held lumps of cheese, and a skillfully made gold plaque, or multiple plaques. So they mention here that they smoke weed, but they, uh, the and the tent that goes along with it. They had this little tent that they would pop up, which would be an easily overnighter or something, a pup tent, if you will. And with the, using that pup tent, they'd all get into it. And if hearing the stories of Herodotus and other, that they would get into that and then smoke out, kind of like Spicoli in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and then come out of it, and they would, you know, be somewhat wild. Although some others said that they would come out of it and that this was the drive thing that da 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 and they went all through and it had to do with sacred stuff that they had going on and led it a little more that way rather than Ibby's gone wild if you will in a tent one of the most interesting of the gold plaques depicts a dead man with a female deity a man holding two horses reins and a quiver hanging on a tree the British Museum suggests that the scene may refer to a symbolic marriage between the deceased and now the great mother, a giver of life who is also associated with underworld powers. Their sacred union was essential to death and renewal 
of all living things. And we see a commonality whenever we say something like that with the mother of all concepts, with mother nature itself, and we talk about elfin type people, and it goes along with that a whole lot better, doesn't it? These sacred trees of life and tree worship they have. Here in this depiction, you can see a warrior who is wearing armor and things, which has gone down. His quiver is now hung on a tree, and he's in the lap of this sacred mother. And so you come into this world through that way, and you go through something similar, and you go come from your mother, but that mother comes from the mother of all. It's the one that's depicted here. Kind of like the Sky Mother goes along with the Sky Father. Yeah, e even, even Yahweh had a wife named Asherah. She's the Queen of Heaven. And now we have an effigy where we get to go into heaven like the gods that are written in the constellations. All these elder people had a belief that we went to another place which was like the underworld. And there's a lot of strangers that come out of that. But in most places, it was Elysian fields, things along that line. And you see these people, and they lived in these giant areas that were pretty much Eden-esque Elysian fields. Pretty intricate saddle on this horse. You can see it's cinch, extra straps hanging down and so on. There's two horses. The one man here, who's his friend, is sitting next to him, but he's again with the Sky Mother here, and they show her with this strange whoops strange fez looking type of cap on top of her head which leads up to something that looks a little jaggedy like lightning going through the tree there this looks very much like the halupa tree of anana but i won't make more connections than that necessarily right now but it's from the fourth and third century bc or so apart from artifacts on loan from the hermitage museum <clears throat> there are pieces on display from the National Museum of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the Ashmolean and the Royal Collection in the UK. Sounds like a great exhibit. I'd like to see it. I'll probably look it up here on YouTube and see if I can find somebody who went through the exhibit. But I couldn't probably use that and talk to you all about, hey, look at this, because it'd get flagged from someone else's usage, even though that's supposed to be free and fair usage, somewhat. So you can see this CAT scan they did of him, and that scar that ran through there. And one wonders what happened to the end of this warrior. Well, they talked about also in that ancient tales that not too many of these people got old. And that was another thing that led to that strange tales about it. Well, why don't they get old? Well, there was a lot of inner fighting between all these different ones as far as coming together and not coming together and so on. But then some of these people left, and they ended up heading west. Yeah, it's you. It, it, it's you. It's part of what makes up you. And that incredible journey and the things that went along with it, and the things before, the things that were met when they came, and the things after led to all the mythologies that we know of today as pixies and elves and fairies and we've talked about that in other videos and the, the Pictus people that had tattoos all over them and where that comes from but you can see it in Utsi the Iceman but you can see it in pre-dynastic and dynastic Egyptians and this thing carried through and the ancient Libyans had it too even on Egyptian art it always shows them with it but that's other connections that we made in other videos Anyhow, Scythian warriors. Peace.